The greatest joy is when we see people come in and they look in the store and they're like, wow, look at all these books with brown people on it. It looks like candy, chocolate candy. Or when young folk come in and they say, oh, look at her. Look at her. She looks like me or I do that. You know, when, when kids, children are in the store and they see themselves represented uh, and, and to watch young folk who come in literally as toddlers and now they're 17 years old. We've been in business. Hello and a spirited welcome to Cambridge Forum and to 2023. We're coming to you live via Zoom. I'm Mary Stack, the Executive Director, and today I'm delighted to be handing over the microphone to Andrew Kimball, who will be guest moderating today's program. I'm equally pleased to be shepherding a topic dear to my heart, books and bookstores, independent bookstores. Gloria Steinem once said, wherever I go, bookstores are still the closest thing to a town square. And I couldn't put it better. Without further ado, I'm going to hand over now to Andrew, who, when not frequenting new and used bookstores himself, has his hands for being Associate Director of Alumni and Donor Relations and Director of Online Lifelong Learning at BU School of Theology. Welcome, Andrew. Welcome, everybody. Welcome. Well, thank you, Mary, for such a warm introduction. And good evening, everyone. I'm good evening. <laughs> yes, sir. I'm Andrew Kimball, and I'm thrilled to serve as moderator for tonight's discussion about the resurgence of the independent bookstore. As Mary said, I am a bibliophile who loves frequenting local bookstores for several reasons. I enjoy their feng shui and aesthetic appeal, the way the spaces represent the interest of the people in their neighborhood or community, and of course, it gives me the chance to browse the stacks with other like-minded people in search of a new find. Well, something exciting and rather unexpected has happened over the past few years. More than 300 new independent bookstores have opened across the country and the bookstore owners and their inventory have become much more diverse. This is partly attributable to the pandemic. People were shuttered in for extended periods and had time to read. Secondly, they recognized their hunger for a place of connection that was safe. The public had rallied to support their local bookstores during lockdown, and when restrictions relaxed, people, people returned to their favorite places. These precious bookstores represented much more than anonymous Amazonian warehouses for purchasing. They had become much needed centers for community engagement and dialogue, a nexus of ideas and human interaction. Consequently, an array of people from various backgrounds use their savings or government stimulus checks to pursue the dream of opening their own bookstore. Despite the numerous ongoing challenges, few seemed to have regretted their decision. To help us understand what is involved in running a bookstore and to meet some of these special book folk who are prepared to dedicate their lives to this cause, we are joined tonight by three guests who reflect quite distinct areas of our literary marketplace. First, we have Leonard and Clarissa Egerton, who are the owners of Frugal Bookstore in Roxbury, the only Black-owned bookstore in Boston. Since 2008, they have worked diligently to be a place where people in their community, young and old, can see themselves reflected in the pages of books. Leonard and Clarissa are business partners and the proud parents of four children, ages 13 through 30 years old. Leonard is here today on their behalf. They are joined by Christina Pascucci Chiampa, the owner of All She Wrote Books in Somerville, which is an inclusive, feminist, and queer indie bookstore that supports, celebrates, and amplifies another section of underrepresented voices. And finally, we welcome Rachel Cass, the general manager of Harvard Bookstore in Cambridge. Harvard Bookstore has been a locally owned, independently run bookstore since 1932. Rachel will also be managing the Harvard Bookstore, which is due to open in the Prudential Center in July, an ambitious venture occupying 30,000 square feet. Welcome to all of you. Wow. Well, let's get started by asking each of you in turn, what is your bookstore's specific mission 
and how did the store come into being? And I think maybe we can go from youngest bookstore to oldest bookstore for this first question. I think Christina, you will be first. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Andrew. Um, so being the youngest <laughs> in the group, I, I say that jokingly. Um, so All She Wrote Books uh, is Boston's really only queer feminist bookstore that exists. Um, uh, we started as a pop-up bookstore. So we used to travel like, like a mobile bookstore to different markets, different locations, and um, started very small with intentions of eventually going with a brick and mortar. Um, and that occurred... Um, <laughs> Interestingly enough, in 2020, it was not the original intention, um, but uh, we still press forward and we've been in the same location for over two years. Um, I'm really excited to be part of that. Um, but ultimately, like one of the biggest reasons why I chose to open the bookstore was because of the fact that I wasn't seeing the representation that of queer voices, of voices that have been historically marginalized um, across the board, aside from obviously going and walking into frugal, um, there really wasn't much of that. And so I really wanted to see more queer stories. And that means this, not the same five queer stories or queer fem or feminist texts that we constantly see all the time on the shelves. It was about different types of stories, like about second wave feminism, its flaws and its beauties. So it, having that representation in the store was super important. Um, yeah, so I will leave it at that. I'm sure I'll answer more questions later on. So thank you for having me though. Leonard, can you tell us a little bit about the Frugal Bookstore mission and how you came into being? Well, Frugal Bookstore, I, I learned now we're a middle child from Christina's youngest. Uh, that's cool, though. I like being a middle child. Um, we, we actually started because I was looking for employment. And there was a furniture store in our neighborhood, Frugal Furniture. And within the furniture store, there was like a niche um, where there were books. And I asked the gentleman, you know, if I could um, work with him. And he said he was looking for somebody to help him with his books. And that was really great because it was along the lines that I was looking for, you know, employment that I was looking for. So I started working there with him and he asked me would I help him to continue build the bookstore because all of the books in there were like something that I had never seen before. It was like a lot of books with people who looked just like me. And for him, it was important that he had those kinds of books in the neighborhood because he was in that neighborhood with a business. So after a little while, we, we, um, we were able to build a little uh, following and he told me if we continued down this path that he would eventually sell us the bookstore. And when I say us, I mean my, who is now my wife, Clarissa. At the time we were courting and I, I not only courting, I had to convince her to leave her cushy job in, um, in the banking world and help build the business. And true to his word, Mr. Romano, he sold us the bookstore in 2008. And from that moment, you know, it when it became ours, we knew that you know part of our mission was to um, change minds one book at one book at a time. That's our slogan, and what that means is it, within our community, we um, are historically um, sometimes looked at as having a low literacy literacy rate. So we wanted to help increase the literacy rate. We wanted to become a place where folk could come in. They didn't have to go, you know, um, outside of the community to go to a bookstore. They could come right around the corner, right down the street and come to a bookstore and see themselves in all the books that were in the bookstore. You know, um, just like Christina, representation, it, it means a lot. You know, people can come into our store and they can see 
um, not just the ordinary Maya Angelou's and the uh, James Baldwin's. You know, we have a lot of local authors who look just like we look and their books are in our store. So representation meant a lot for us. Thank you so much. You're Rachel, welcome. Rachel, Harvard Bookstore has a long legacy and perhaps history. Tell us a little bit more about your mission and how you came yeah. into yeah, thanks for having me. Um, so Harvard Bookstore started in 1932, um, before the days when there were real university bookstores, campus bookstores. So um, we were started by a man named Mark Kramer. Um, and over the years, we've sold used textbooks to the university um, was, was sort of where we got our start. Um, we're not affiliated with the university anymore. We don't, do, or we're not affiliated with the university at all. We don't really do textbooks anymore. Um, but while our mission isn't sort of as specific as Christina's and Leonard's, we are at an academic, uh, we're in an academic neighborhood, we're right across the street from Widener Library, and we really see our mission as trying to make uh, ideas as accessible as possible to people. Um, so we have a really wide ranging inventory, everything from fiction, including genre fiction, through lots of academic subjects, including philosophy, sociology. Um, we have a huge history section. Um, and we really want to be a place where people can come and engage in ideas, both through our selection and through the author events that we host. Um, yeah. Thank you so much. All distinct missions, but somewhat related. And let's dive a little bit deeper. Given your mission, what is your approach to curating books? Curate has Latin roots meaning to care for. When we think of museum curators, they typically have an eye for a specific type of art or artifact. What is your eye drawn to when it comes to choosing books? And who are your customers? I think this time, let's begin with Leonard and then go back to Christina and then Rachel. I think Leonard might actually be frozen. Um, let's come back to Leonard. So with the books that we stock at the bookstore, um, you know, I think one of the biggest things is the fact that um, similar to what Leonard just mentioned about being able to see yourself in the pages that are within the books on the shelf. So um, it's about representation of oneself. So for me as a queer person, like, being able to see myself within the pages of different stories and not just stories of sadness. I think that is a perception of, you know, queer um, stories, whether they're fiction or nonfiction, there seems to be this like thing about, um, you know, struggle, constant struggle, but there's actually not just that it's, there's more than that. There's joy, there's beauty, there's kindness, there's laughter, there's many other components to that. And I think why, you know, our curation is the way it is in the breadth of it is because we want to display all of those types of feelings and emotions that one would get, um, you know, from those different stories and those different perspectives. So it's really important to have that reflected. So for us, our curation in having that representation. The other piece of the representation, though, is calling out some of the, you know, whether it's feminism, like when we're talking about feminism, there are many windows, <laughs> not windows, but there are many things and perspectives about feminism. There's the great things about feminism. There's also the dark stuff. So it's making sure that that is also reflected within the books on our shelves as well. So it's really important to have those different perspectives across the board, even though we are very much curated um, with the types of books that we have. So it's just important to make sure. And then also to have, you know, with intersectional feminism, right? So what is that? What does that look like? And how does that look today versus in the 70s when there was the second wave, right? So being able to to see that and understand that both from a, an adult perspective, but also all the way down to a child's perspective. So making sure that our curation is reflective of that is extremely important and relates back to our mission. Um, so. Awesome, thank you. And Rachel. Yeah, at our store, we think a lot about um, 
looking for new ideas, looking for a range of ideas. Um, so in all of our sections, we're a fairly large store. We have um, 5,500 square feet. So we have room for a lot of books in our store, um, but we're really trying to look for new ideas. Um, we're trying to look to include as many voices as we can in all of our sections. Um, because we're a large store, we're able to make, we're able to carry a lot of books, um, a lot of titles in each section, but we think really carefully about curation, particularly in terms of the books that we display at the front of the store and the books that we feature. Um, so we sort of think about what is our community interested in? What are they looking for? What ideas are new that they might not know about, but might be interested in? Um, and we're really doing that across all subjects. Like I said, we, we sort of have an academic bent. So we have a new academic section at the front of our store and we're trying to bring new titles from academic presses to the forefront across topics. We do a lot of science, a lot of history, a lot of philosophy and cultural criticism, that type of thing. Um, but we also have staff recommendations at the front of the store that are really our staff's personality and what they're loving. And that that really runs the gamut from romance novels through more academic books and everything in between. Um, so we do, uh, um, again, we sort of do less very specific curation, but we're really looking for what's new um, and what people haven't seen before in addition to the things that we know they're gonna come to us for because we're a general bookstore. Can you speak a little bit about the printing press that used to be at Harvard Bookstore? how popular that might have been and why that's no longer accessible. Yeah, um, so we used to have a print on demand machine. Um, if you've been in the store, it's actually still there. It's not really operating um, anymore. Um, we stopped that business last spring. It, there were really wonderful things about it and there were real challenges about it. And just as a piece of our business, it didn't really make sense to keep, keep it going. Um, but we did have some really wonderful experiences with it. Um, one thing we all loved was that all of the books that are across the street at Widener Library, you know, you have to have a Harvard ID to get into Widener Library. But if they were in the public domain and had been scanned by Google, we were able to print them. So um, when my husband was doing his PhD dissertation, I printed books for him at the store um, that he could use for his research that were sort of primary texts, um, for example. Um, but we also did a lot of printing for local authors, um, for people doing you know, a family cookbook that they wanted to print 30 copies of and give out a, at a reunion or people who are actually printing their book to be sold in the store and to sold, be sold other places. Um, so it really, and we did some projects ourselves. We did some short story contests and other things that we printed on it for ourselves. So it was really fun to have in the store. Um, and I, I think in many ways, a great community outreach, but in, in, in the end, it didn't really make sense to keep it going at the point that we were at, which was, it was a little sad to let it go. And Christina, for you at All She Wrote, in addition to selling wonderful selections of books, what other um, services or programs might you do for the community? Yeah, so back in, um... 2021, we had start, started a actual free little library in the East Somerville community um, that specifically um, had a curation very much like ours, so reflective of the community. So that included Spanish language books, that included um, books with people of color, that included the range of books, so adult to, to uh, you know, toddler or baby, um, and really making sure that that was accessible to everyone. So that was in partnership with a lovely organization church called Connection that is in East Somerville. Um, Andrew and I have a common thread there. Uh, Pastor Jordan Harris is a lovely friend of ours and who had helped me um, bring that together in an open space that they had um, available within their front um, their front area when you first walk in. So and the response that we received from the community has been really amazing and uh, to the point where, you know, we've done a few fundraisers this year around it uh, to continue to support that free book, um, that free little library. Um, and it's not really little, it's kind of decently sized. I'd say it's like a good size wall if, if you look at it, but we're really proud of that project. Um, the other things we do, we also do other types of things that maybe you wouldn't think about with a bookstore. So we actually host comedy nights. We have comics, local comics uh, from the area that um, are just super talented, amazing people. Um, 
looking to get their start and uh, shout out to Fodball Productions. They're an amazing group. Check them out. Um, we usually host them about once a month. And with those shows, we tie an element of um, an organization to it. So this actually last Friday, we actually did a fundraiser for the Brain Aneurysm Foundation. Um, my father passed away from a brain aneurysm in 2021. Um, he did get to see the bookstore in all its glory before he passed. Um, but it was really important uh, for this comedy show to um, have that piece to it. And a lot of the comedy shows that we run have, you know, we've donated to the Trans Emergency Fund, um, the um, Room to Read Project, um, many different types of organizations. So so it's more than just a bookstore. It's it's a community space. It's a space to, you know, do more than just sell books and talk about books, but to have like conversations and et cetera. Um, so yeah, those are that's just a sampling. You could always look on our website to see what other things we do, but yeah. Yeah, thank you so much. And Leonard, you escaped my, my second question uh, <laughs> for you. Uh, what do you think of as you curate the shelves at Frugal Bookstore? What do I think of? I think I think of all the books that all the other bookstores don't have. You know, we we um it, it it's really easy to you know go to the publishers and get all the books that you know come out every week, come out every month, every Tuesday. I think books come out, but we we look for those books that are written by black authors and Latino authors and African authors and local authors that a lot of other places do not have, you know, cause like I say, it's easy to get those books. It's, it's a lot harder to source um, locally um, authored books, which we have a lot of in our bookstore. Um, <clears throat> we call it Boston's finest. That's the name of the section. So it, it's like, it's, it's really fun at times because, you know, I, I get to spend a lot of time just online, just looking or going through emails and going through Twitter, seeing who's trying to sell their books that live around the corner that we don't know about, you know? So it's, it's, it can be a very sometimes trying time because a lot of local authors don't have the same resources as the um, authors who are uh, with the bigger publishing houses. So they're not always able to keep their books in print. You know, so when you're able to get those books, it's it's a gem. And it's something that, like I say, we highlighted by in our section, Boston's Finest. That's a great segue into our next question that gets to the business of indie bookstores. Uh, it's a bit wordy, so bear with me. The New York Times highlighted the fact that the 300 plus bookstores that have opened in the past couple of years are more diverse and that the rapid growth of physical book shops is especially surprising at a time when brick and mortar stores face crushing competition from Amazon and other online retailers. But one expected outcome of the pandemic was that many communities rallied around their bookstores in a time of crisis. In what ways have your communities rallied around your bookstores during and post pandemic? Uh, let's work our way backwards. Rachel, let's begin with you and then Leonard and then Christina. Sure, yeah. Um, so we closed our doors in the middle of March 2020, like everyone did, um, and we truly didn't do any fulfillment of orders or anything for a couple of months, three, three months maybe. Um, eventually, we started fulfilling our own web orders again, um, and then we opened our doors to the public with limited uh, capacity in, I think, I think it was July of that summer. Um, so we opened, we reopened pretty early once we were able to do that. But we have always, we've had a website for a very long time. We're harbor.com. Um, and we've sold books through that for a very long time, but it's been a relatively small part of our business. And we really, really saw that take off during the pandemic. And people really were coming to us to shop online when we were closed and when we were open, but limited hours or limited capacity. Um, and we really saw people step up. Um, at one point in the fall, um, our owners, Jeff and Linda, sent an email um, to our customers sort of saying what the state of the situation was and 
what we needed for the holidays and how, sort of how important it was to get us through. Um, and our customers really, really responded. Um, and it's been really wonderful. Um, now that we're open sort of normal hours again, um, we're really seeing people come back and that's been wonderful too. It was a really bustling holiday season, which was so fun. Um, I was in the store a lot um, in the weeks before Christmas um, and it was really a lot of fun. We've also, we've had these in-person warehouse sales at our warehouse um, offsite for years and they were really a lot of, they were packed, packed sales. Um, we sell bargain books out of our, out of our warehouse. Um, and we had to stop doing those during the pandemic, but we moved those online as well. And people have showed up for those too. So um, I think during the pandemic, people saw businesses that they really loved close um, because it was just such a challenging time for small businesses, especially. Um, and I think it really brought it home for people that if there are businesses that they love, and they want to stay there, they have to support them. And I know that we saw that from our customers and are continuing to see that. And, and Leonard, uh, while you're with us, in what ways have your communities rallied around your bookstore during and post pandemic? The immediate community came out, but the much broader community came out when uh, the pandemic began. You know, and like everyone else, else on the panel, the, you know, the governor gave the order to close stores. So um, folk kept buying from us on the Internet. And that turned into we had to pivot to selling online and fulfilling orders online. So we changed the, the look of the bookstore. It became like a little fulfillment center. And then. You know, I, I like to say it, it was a bittersweet time for us when George Floyd was murdered. And <clears throat> folk, there was a change in attitude in the country. It seemed like folk wanted to read about what the history of black people and, uh, and other marginalized people, what we go through or have gone through. And I, fortunate we had a friend of ours, Kim Parker, who uh, she had a lot of educators online, a lot of folk all over the country who who pay attention to to her. And they were asking her, how can we support? And she said, you can read. And not only read, you can buy it from a black owned bookstore or you can buy it from a small bookstore. And I tell you, within 24 hours, we had like 20,000 orders that came from all over the country. And that's how we were supported. You know? So it, it, it took all hands on deck. My whole family was involved in getting these orders out to people all across this country. And it, it hasn't stopped in a sense. We still have um, are, are the beneficiary of a lot of support from people, not only in our community, but around this country who like what we do. We originally had um, the intention of opening our brick and mortar and doing a big grand opening around Indie Bookstore Day of 2020. And obviously that did not happen um, clearly. So the room that you're seeing me in this evening, this is the shipping and fulfillment that occurred from January <laughs> to May of 2020. So thank you to everyone who did do that. Um, and that was kind of how we started. And we were fortunate enough to um, get some folks to notice us um, that we were, you know, we had the intentions of opening our bookstore very soon. Um, and so we had some press that allowed us to give recommendations. Uh, shout out to Boston Mag for that. Um, and so that really sent people to our website. So similar to Leonard, Literally, we had to go online and that was not something that was fully built out for us because we were just doing pop ups. Um, so my me, myself and I built the entire e-commerce site that you see today um, for All She Wrote Books um, in a previous life. That's what I used to do. Um, I'm a former marketer and web person, so um, it was not hard for me to do, but it was definitely a labor of love. Um, and then finally, when we were able to actually occupy our space again for the first time, that's when we got to work and, you know, started getting ready to open, which similar to Rachel, we opened July 10th of 2020 was our first official day. Um, and that meant to appointment only 
massed and, um, you know, mostly parties of four people or more. It was really important for us to keep our community safe. Um, but at the same time, though, despite the fact that, like, yeah, we were the new kid on the block. Yeah, many people didn't really know about us yet. But the thing is, is that those who did come, those who did show up, they showed up and they consistently showed up and they continue to show up today. And I feel like echoing kind of what Leonard was mentioning and and Rachel is like your community, they'll show up for you. And, uh, you know, our community has grown since then because of the, of the, you know, efforts that we do in the community. And, you know, the fact that we've had our own drag queen store, drag, drag uh, story hour, you know, interrupted a little bit, you know, people have heard about us and want to help and do more. So, you know, but it's all positive. So that's the most important thing here is that when your community exists, they show up and they'll consistently show up for you. And I feel like that's the thing that we can sit with and be, you know, you know, be settled with it, if you will. Like it's, it's a beautiful thing. And, you know, and many of us are so appreciative of it. So mm -hmm, mm -hmm. we talked a lot about a lot about the upside of, of the indie bookstore enterprise. Let's talk a little bit about the challenges because uh, our Q&A is filling up with questions about the rising rents in Boston, et cetera. So in what ways do you see the landscape of independent bookstores evolving in the future in the full knowledge that there are challenges? Many bookstore owners are confronting new uncertainty about the overall economy, labor shortages, supply chain snafus, rising rents and interest rates, higher cost of goods, and people tightening grains on their spending, all of which can drive down consumer spending. Will books suffer? I'll leave that question to the floor. <laughs> Will books suffer? Um, <clears throat> it's, it's, it's always um, a thought that because of like we're in an area that's that's being gentrified right now going through gentrification and it's always in the back of our mind that someone could come and buy this building and jack the rent up and we'll, would we be able to survive we would hope we could depend on um that community effort to help us stay alive and they would want a bookstore to stay here because we've been here so long. Um, but we're well aware that with, with the processes that are going on in this city that, you know, we could force, possibly forcibly moved out of here, you know, um, and have to start over somewhere. It's always a fright. You know, the, the, the supply and demand, the supply chain is also always a worry. You know, the folk come in and they, they want their books. They want them when they want them. And, it, you know, sometimes you, we're up against Amazon. You know, we're up, a, up against other bookstores that are, that are in, the, um, in these community, in our communities. So it's, it's, it's always a, a concern that however the tide of society turns, you know, will we be able to successfully, you know, ride the wave with it? But that's our biggest concern now is probably gentrification. Yeah, I'll just echo a lot of that. I mean, we're we're extremely lucky in Harvard Square to have Harvard as our landlord instead of much of Harvard Square, which is owned by, you know, out of state developers who don't care what the neighborhood looks like. Um, and we're in a community that really values having a bookstore. And so we're, we're very lucky in that way. But there are lots of challenges. Um, you know, the supply chain stuff, like Leonard said, has been very challenging always, but especially in the last few years. Um, I mean, we've been talking recently, literally about the space that we have to receive books, because publishers are often sending book or this is so in the weeds, but are sending book orders sort of in more pieces than they used to before. What used mm. to come in three big boxes is now coming in, you know, eight smaller boxes. And do we have space to put those in? And like, that's such a nitty gritty um, on the ground problem, but it's a real problem that we're talking about in meetings this week because our receiving area is too full. 
Um, and that, yeah, that's just a little example, but there are, there are constantly challenges related to um, the publishing industry in particular, which is sort of its own unique, strange, um, strange place, um, as well as the, the issues that are sort of going on with small businesses all over. Um, it's challenging. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of interesting. So I've been in Somerville for about eight years now. And where I occupy space is fully gentrified. And um, I am pretty much the littlest fish in the biggest pond of big box stores. Um, and that concerns me daily, mostly because um, while our landlord is kind, um, unfortunately, sales and numbers drive their reasonings behind why we should be in a location versus not, which is always concerning. So it's a constant battle of justifying why we should exist. And that to me is tiring, but not a fight that I'm willing to give up on. And so... Sorry. Yeah, you know, like we'll continue to to do that. Um, and whether it's we are where we are or we have to go elsewhere, my my thing is is that I want to keep this bookstore in Somerville. Um, this is where we started. This is also just a little history fact here. Somerville is the first location, and I think there's someone on this call this evening that might know this information. But I I think she's in the um chat, but um, the first feminist bookstore that existed in Boston, New Words, one of its first locations is was on Washington Street in Somerville for a few years, starting in the early 70s. Mm -hmm. um, and then they officially then moved to the Inman Square location at 186 and a half Hampshire Street. So to me, it's, it's a nostalgic um, thing of like being in this community, but also like you know, like gentrification is real. I'm, you know, what Leonard is talking about is real. And a developer could come in at any time and just completely take us out. But the thing is, is that we have to, we are constantly by us consistently showing up and doing the work that we do every day, both in our communities and in our bookstores. That just demonstrates how powerful we are and why we exist. And so, you know, I'm the type of person that, I'm just going to keep fighting the fight. My dad was that way and I'm just that way myself. And so to me, like we should be here, we should exist and like, you know, supply chain. Yeah. You know, but I also think people have to also have some realistic expectations of life. Um, and that may need to be a reset of people, but I feel like that reset did happen a little bit in the pandemic. I don't think it was a full reset, but I think there was a reset. And it's something that I constantly talk about all the time in the bookstore is like the fact that, you know, patience is virtue. I know that sounds cliche, but it really truly is. And once you have that book in your hand, nothing else matters at that point. So a ballpark or a very roundabout answer to your question, Andrew, is that, yeah, like it's scary. It's a scary thing right now. And you don't know what's going to happen. But if you live in that fear and you just continuously let that fester, like you're not going to, you're going to forget all the amazing work and the things that you're doing for both your community as well as your, your store itself. So I think you have to balance out those two things. And, um, you know, it's, it's, it's tough. It's not the easiest thing, but it's doable. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and just a broad question uh, from each of you. What do you think is behind the resurgence of the indie bookstore? You know, pu public libraries have experienced a resurgence because citizens are desperate for a third space, someone in our audience said. That is a space that is not work or home. Uh, do you feel the indie bookstore is sort of that in between, that third space for many people? I, I, I think people just genuinely want somewhere close by to go, you know, to have, have a space where they can come in and like, like our bookstore is somewhere where people meet people. We meet a lot of people. We have a lot of gorgeous and beautiful conversations in our bookstore. 
Uh, we meet people from other countries. People visit um, us and th they come here to visit their family. They bring their family here. Uh, we're, we're, we're meeting people from other states. It's, it's, it's become a place where people don't want to go outside their neighborhood um, all the time. They want to be able to walk around the corner and be able to get what they want. And fortunately, now it's, you know, for us, they want to be able to walk around the corner and, and grab a book. Yeah, Rachel and then Christina. Um, yeah, I think that's a big part of it. I think, I think coming back into the bookstore space, um, I remember being in the bookstore, this is pre-pandemic, but I remember being in the bookstore the day after Donald Trump was elected. And it was just, we were, we were crying in the aisles and customers were crying. And it was this moment of like, this is the home that I want to go to. Like, these are the people that I want to be around and, and sort of process this with. Um, and we've had many, many situations like that. It's a place that you can go to meet ideas and to sort of think through, um, think through the issues that are happening in the world with, other people who also want to be thinking those things through. Mm -hmm. um, and we see that in our author events, um, people sort of gathering together to uh, talk about the issues of the day. Um, but we, we see that just in the aisles. We see that in conversations with customers. Um, you know, we see that when we're recommending books to people and the conversations that come out of that. Um, so I do think that that's a really important space. Um, my, our bookstore is in Cambridge, obviously. Um, I live in Melrose and there's a new bookstore that's uh, scheduled to open in Melrose later this month. Um, and I'm going to be able to walk to it. And I'm so thrilled to have a bookstore in my neighborhood. And I don't need a place to go to buy books. I have access to books at work all the time. But I'm so thrilled to be able to go and have this place in my community. Um, and I know there have been studies done about sort of the, the outsized level of engagement that bookstores bring to their communities beyond the sort of economics of it, but the community that they bring to um, the spaces that they are. So I do think that's a big part of it, especially when we've all been, we were all home for so long. So for us in our bookstore, like, you know, as I mentioned, like during the pandemic, even though like we were all masked and like separated six feet and, you know, all the things I think, you know, having a space to come and, and have conversations, even like dip, like to, to Leonard's point about difficult conversations is the beauty of why our spaces exist and why they continue to exist. And I think that, um, you know, for us, like I think about with the recent bans of LGBTQ books in particular, I think of the, you know, the issues with the drag story hour, we continue to have drag story hour and we will continue to have drag story hour at our space because that's what you do. Um, but also, you know, people feel like this is a space that they can air our, our space is a place where they can air out their frustrations, but that's also a space for folks that may not understand, you know, queer life and queer perspectives also come to be educated. So it's an opportunity for us to connect them with books to help understand maybe their loved ones, whether it's their children or, or friends or other family members. And I feel like that connection alone is just so powerful and so beautiful. And, you know, when you can have those spaces to, to have the difficult conversations, to challenge uh, ideals and concepts and things like that throughout life, you know, like bookstore, indie bookstores are more than just us selling you a book and you walking out the door. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the part of this that makes us so important in our communities. Um, because it's more than just the transaction. It's ultimately like those co human connections, the connections that we have with each other. And despite our differences, right? Like, you know, we all have our feelings and thoughts on different topics and different things. They're still, we're still human. But the thing is, is I hope what we can do is learn from each other and be willing to be open and, you know, want to learn. And, you know, there's not a, you know, sometimes we see a lot of stories and things out in the news and things like that 
on Facebook that kind of tell us a different world. But I do truly, and this may sound naive, I truly do believe though that there is there are people that are willing to, to come to the table and hopefully learn. And what we, what I hope to do, like, at least in our space is give them the tools to then learn and to, to change their, you know, not behavior, but to, to rethink and, and constantly relearn. And when we give ourselves the opportunity to constantly learn things, what the hope is, is that we have empathy for others that we may not necessarily understand. And so that to me is like the power here of like what we do, but what our indies do for people and, and why businesses like ours are so essential to the community. So, Yes. And um, speaking of education and expanding one's perspective, we have to talk about the banning of books. We have to. So during the past two years, more than 1600 books were banned from school libraries, according to a Penn America report affecting 138 school districts in 32 states. In this political and social climate, do you feel even more of an obligation or responsibility to carry and sell certain books? Are you making ethical decisions about the books you carry? And in what ways, if any, does the banning, burning of books impact your mission? I, I, um, I, I just listened to a, a report, I think it was earlier this morning about all boys aren't blue and, and how the book is banned. And I, I, I don't agree with it. And I, I don't make it a point to look at what books have inside of them. Um, I don't buy, we don't buy books like that. We buy books that people want. Um, and I, I, I think it's, Although I disagree, I think it's good that people keep saying ban these books because it becomes good for us. You could, then people come looking for those books, you know. Um, so it, it, it's unfortunate that uh, people want to ban what's inside of a book. Just don't buy the book. You know, um, uh, it, it, it's I look for them, to be honest with you. I, I don't I don't shy away from it. You know, whether it's about race, religion or family or, or whatever, um, if 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 it's a book that stirs controversy, then I, I want the book in our bookstore, you know, um, and, and, and to help promote those, you know, um, those books that people, you know, I think it's really narrow to think that um, you have the right to say um Oh, we don't want those books there, but you, you can have those books over there. So, yeah, that's my thinking. Yes, it, you know, it's like when Mama says, "The fire is hot. Don't touch it." it my house. Right. See for myself. <laughs> Try it out. Yeah, Christina. So, um, you know, many of the books that are banned right now are, you know, a good chunk of them have to do with LGBTQ plus. Um, stories, but there are also ones that feature people of color, which is even more bonkers. Like, it's just, you know, the thing is, is that like, to Leonard's point, we're going to stock the books and that's what we do. And, um, you know, and we talk about them consistently, but I also think like, then we are here. So our bookstore in particular has helped numerous amounts of other communities. So to shout out to Waltham, the little free queer library in Waltham. There's been news stories about that being ransacked multiple times due to people just being ridiculous and just leave it at that. But, you know, and we are one of the bookstores when I saw that they're po like, they posted that someone went in and took all the books out of their, out of their library I saw their post on Instagram and I texted, I sent them a DM and I was like, give me your address. No questions asked, just give me your address. And I sent all the books that I knew that they had in the library back to them because that's what you do. Um, and you just like consistently put it out there and people are going to ban what they want. It's because they are afraid of what they don't want to understand. And I think that's the, that's the issue here is like, you have folks that are 
unfortunately very close-minded in the regard of like being open to understanding that there are different perspectives other than theirs. And that scares them. That scares them that there are other th things in the world that are not necessarily within their own bubble or whatever they want to put themselves in. And I feel like it's, you know, the, the, this thing like with Florida and in particular, like we send books down there. We have customers that buy books from us. I've met multiple teachers from Florida who have come to the bookstore because they know of our space and they were visiting family and they were telling me of the things of the fact that they are, they have been sent letters to, to be told that they need to take these books out within X amount of time. Otherwise they will lose their jobs it is now gotten to a point where the ridiculousness of it is to an extreme where it's concerning. And at the same time, like, that's why like places like our indie bookstores need to be there and be the ones that are like, okay, like we will continue to give you these books and expose you to this and let you know that, Hey, this is actually banned. And you might be like completely surprised, but knowing and understanding is the first step to hopefully helping us fight these bands and consistently supporting those that are fighting these bands. And so to me, like it's, it, again, we are constantly going at it, but it, to me, like it's an important fight because, you know, as a, as a queer person, like who used to go to her little library, cause I couldn't afford to have books as a kid. Um, for me, not being able to see people that were like me on those shelves, that was hard. I didn't really get to see my, my people that represented me as a queer person until I was like much older. And so, you know, and that's because I lived in a very white, very conservative community and that sucks. And so, you know, it's important to like, the bands only hurt people. And like, that's just why, you know, it's so important for folks like us to, to continue to stock the books, to continue to make them available mm -hmm. and continue to talk about them all the time. And so I think that's, that's the best that, you know, for right now, that's what we can do and continue to be out there and talking about them constantly, I think is really important. Thank you so much. And Rachel, if you have anything to add, I would just ask if you can give us a 60 minute response so we can ask you all a two part question to close us out. Okay, um, I have two thoughts on this and I'll try and make them quick. I mean, on, on the one hand, I agree with everything that Christina and Leonard said. I mean, so much that's behind these book bans is about denying the humanity of groups of people and denying the existence of groups of people. And so we, you know, we, we try to show as many voices as we can. And so it's really important to us to have, we have a banned books display in our store that sort of constantly rotates and we pay attention to what's in the news. Um, and just sort of making sure that those voices are, are seen and recognized. Um, and in, just in terms of, you asked about if we think about ethics in how we stock our store, something we've wrestled with a lot um, is sort of the flip side is we've recognized more and more over the years what can do harm to our communities and trying not to stock those things. A good example is sort of anti-vaccine books in the um, during the pandemic. And those are things that we want to make sure, you know, I'm not necessarily not going to order it for somebody who asks, but we do th try to think really carefully about both what are the voices that we're putting out there and are we making those accessible to people, but also um, sort of is this actually adding productively to the conversation? So um, we think about those things a lot. We're, we're looking for a real mix of ideas, but doing so in a responsible ethical way as much as possible. Hmm. Yeah, when, when, when Leonard was speaking, I almost wanted to ask him whether or not white supremacist books would live on his shelves, but I would guess no, for example, because there is an ethics and, and, and choice you have to make about what you expose your audience to. You know. That's that that's that's true. You know, that there are there are books that people would question. You know, why do you have this book or that book? And I I don't I don't want to be the person that says, you know, no, I'm not gonna buy that book for you. You know, because everyone that, that would be the same as banning books. You know, um I don't I don't and we don't want to be those kinds of people or, or that type of bookstore and, and and truthfully speaking like 
uh, Rachel said, you don't want to promote like um, books that are against getting vaccinations. But if someone comes in the store, you'll purchase it for them. Um, s- some people come in and they're really quiet about it because they may be like hesitant to ask you to purchase. Do you have this book? Yeah. Um, no, but we can get it for you. So one of the things, oh, sorry, Leonard, did you want to finish up on your last thought? No, it was, it was just that it's a, it's a real thin line to walk with that because you, you don't want to be seen or known. Well, I can't go to that bookstore. I want everyone to come here, you know, from all over, come and visit us. You know, we get any book that you want if it's not on our shelves. That's what I wanted to say. So to echo your point about a thin line, I, I definitely understand that. I, however, like one of the things that I think, I guess if you want to regulate, like, for example, JK Rowling, not to bring up that person, but, you know, is extremely transphobic and hurtful to the queer community in their words and what they do and their actions and the continuous ways that they continue to spew that hate. So we don't stock JK Rowling's books, like, and we will not order them for you. It's, and the reason why I talk about this is because like, to Leonard and Rachel's point, I don't want to ban or restrict anyone from getting anything. So what I do instead is I refer folks to other bookstores like the two we have on this on this panel or others because our you know our mission driven bookstore is just that is just crossing a line that we've drawn in the sand because we respect the community that we serve and we are meant to serve and so and it is it's a delicate line it's a totally mm-hmm. delicate line um but i believe in standing firm with my feelings on that, like that kind of example, it's the same with like, you know, other types of authors who are extremely hurtful to the LGBTQIA community. Um, So we are taking a hard stand on that and it's not to ban them. It it just means you're just not getting them from us, Mm -hmm. but there are plenty of other folks I am happy to send you to that would be happy to order them for you. And that's how we handle it. Um, but I talk about it as a way of why, you know, how we curate our store. It's part of our curation practices as an indie bookstore and as a feminist queer bookstore. Um, so, you know, it may not be a popular thought, you know, opinion, but that's just how we operate. And, you know, it may have impacts down the line, but I, I don't, I don't waver from that kind of thought process and how our mission is. So. That's yeah. oh, Andrew, I know you wanted to move on to the next question. Just to just <laughs> just one other thought on that. I um I think it really does go back to that question of curation and sort of mission. And um, I mean, again, our mission has to do with um making ideas as accessible to people as possible. And we do want to represent a range of ideas um and figuring out sort of how to do that in ways that we feel good about ethically um can can be different. But similar to Leonard, we'll order pretty much everything, but we are choosing the books that are on our shelves. Um, we can't carry every book, even if we wanted to. Um, so we're making those choices every day. And it all comes back to, to that sort of curation uh, question that we talked about at the beginning. Thank you. Thank you. So incredibly insightful for someone like me, who's a pedestrian book lover. I just walk in, find something great, walk out. So thank you for sharing. Um, what has been your best and worst experience? So let's let's flip that. What has been your worst and best experience in the bookstore business? And then to close us out, you could ask this in one answer or answer this in one uh, response. Uh, what makes you proudest? And what aspect of your work brings you the greatest joy? So worst and best experience in the bookstore business, and then what aspect of your work brings you the greatest joy? I'll tell you the first, the, the last piece of it first. Uh, the greatest joy is when we see people come in and they look in the store and they're like, wow, 
Look at all these books with brown people on them. It looks like candy, chocolate candy. Or when young folk come in and they say, oh, look at her. Look at her. She looks like me. Or I do that. You know, when, when kids, children are in the store and they see themselves represented. Um, and and to watch young folk who come in literally as toddlers and now they're 17 years old. We've been in business 16, 17 years now. That's the greatest, one of the greatest joys of, of owning the bookstore. Um, to be able to have a place where we can say that um, we're able to serve our community, um, have a livelihood, and hopefully remain in this community and be able to pass it down to our children and their children and stay rooted in this community. Um, one of the worst things that that happened is when we have to close. I could say that's the worst thing. There's always really, really good experiences in, in the bookstore. Thank you so much. You're uh, welcome. Let's go to Rachel and end with Christina. Sure. Um, yeah, it's it's hard to come up with a worst um, experience at the store. Beyond, I mean, I think closing our stores was was the hardest thing that we've done, um, and and figuring out how to how to regroup from that. How to? I mean, we all hate the word pivot after the last three years, but how to 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 pivot and um, continue doing our business in such a different world. Um, I mean, I agree that the people are the, have by far been the best part of being a bookseller. Um, we, one of the most special customers to me in my time here, um, there was a man who passed away several years ago now, five or six years ago now. Um, he was 99 when he died. Um, and when I started at the bookstore, he came to every single author event that we did. Um, and we do author events five nights a week. Um, and he was there basically every night. Um, and the staff loved him and we grew to know him over the years. Um, he would host holiday parties for our staff, at the, um, like our event staff, because he knew them so well. Um, and he was just interested in everything. He was, he was a photographer. He was a, uh, he was a pilot. He had, he had been a pilot in his career. Um, he had been a photographer and an artist um, he and I played chess um, and he was just wonderful and just really epitomized the like perfect independent bookstore customer who was interested in science and history and fiction and poetry and everything. Um, and he was an extraordinary example, but that is our customer base. There are people who are interested in everything and we learn so much from them. Um, and it's just been really rewarding to, to get to know our community and our, our booksellers are part of that as well. Um, just the most smart, thoughtful people I've ever, I've ever known or people I've met through the bookstore. All right. So I'm assuming I'm going to do this in 60 seconds, right, Andrew? Yeah. Okay. Let's do it. Okay. Let's say 120. No All right. 120 seconds. Got it. All right. So worst thing that's uh, being part of the bookstore. Um, <laughs> so I would say probably the worst thing is obviously not to bring up a sour subject, but uh, receiving death threats for drag story hour is probably the worst part of my job. Um, it's not fun, but I have a candor of, well, you know, keep calling because it's not going to make a difference anyways. So it's probably the worst thing I've had to deal with um, as far as in the book selling world and kind of dealing with that. But I think the most positive thing again is like, and echoing both what Rachel and, and Leonard said, it's people coming in and again, just seeing themselves, the non-binary kid coming in and finding that story that they can relate to and that make them smile and feel seen. Um, that is the most beautiful thing and, you know, I had someone come in once and pick up a book. And I remember them saying like, oh, this is so me. This is who I am. And I feel like that's just like the best gift that working and doing the work that we do can give to us. 
All right. I think that was definitely under 120 seconds. <laughs> so. Yeah. So, thank you so much for your wisdom, uh, insight, and candor today. Uh, and Mary, we're in your hands. Okay. Well, that was a fantastic discussion. I really enjoyed and learned a lot, actually. So I'd like to thank Andrew and all of the guests today, Rachel, Christina, Leonard, for making the time and sharing your observations. It was wonderful. Uh, and your hard work. It's not an easy job. I was surprised nobody said throwing a book at a customer. I was expecting someone to say. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure you've thought about doing it. <laughs> a few times. Okay, well, I just... Like to... <laughs> Um, so I just want to say some thanks. Cambridge Forum is made possible through the generosity of Herbert and Dorothy Vetter, the Lowell Institute, the Mass Cultural Council, Cambridge Community Foundation, and you guys. So don't forget, if you haven't donated, please do. Either way, you can sign up to get uh, information about our upcoming programs on the website, www.cambridgeforum.org. And also there you'll find lots of podcasts of past programs classic digitized recordings of the last 50 odd years we've been doing this. We also do a weekly NPR broadcast and thanks to GBH Forum Network, uh, they will be uploading the video of this very shortly uh, onto YouTube. So you can watch it again and spread it around and um, enjoy it. Um, next forum is in two weeks time on the 31st of January. Why do the humanities matter? Great question. We're going to have Martin Puckner, author of Culture, the story of us from cave art to K-pop, conversing with a very interesting man, Patrick Bringley, who spent 10 years as a museum guard at the Museum of the Metropolitan Art in New York and has just published his experiences called All the Beauty in the World. Quite a remarkable book. So the details of that will be on our website shortly. I'd like to thank you all for making the time to join us for this great topic today. Keep supporting your independent bookstores. Keep buying books. Mm. And we look forward to seeing you on the 31st. Bye-bye. Thanks. <laughs>